this cat right here, this one, keeps meowing during my recording over and over and over again. <sighs> Good kitten, internet. So, normally I start out these label series videos with a weird anecdote during my life that makes absolutely no sense in context, other than the fact that I'm talking about a particular label, which makes it a, you know, a selling point for the fact that this video is going to be weird. I'm not doing that this time because of the content of this video. So this isn't quite a content warning, but a content advisory, shall we say? So this video is about attraction and specifically the labels that we have on attraction. I am dividing attraction out into three categories. That is aesthetic attraction, romantic attraction, and sexual attraction, which means I'm going to be talking about labels of all three of these in the context of my own life. So yes, I am in fact going to be talking about my sexuality on this video. Some people watching may not want to know these things. If that's the case, stop watching. Some people watching this video may be uncomfortable with the content that I have. What I will say is that there is no content in this video I would not be telling a theoretical 13-year-old child of mine. That is to say that there's no vocabulary that I would swap out. There is no personal stories that I would omit or anything like that. At the age of 13, I think a person is old enough to be able to understand and experience and comprehend everything that I'm going to be saying, which also means that I'm not going to be saying anything particularly sexually explicit. Yes, I'm going to be mentioning sex and sexuality, but like, I'm going to be using terms that an average 13-year-old has probably heard thousands of times already in their life. It's not particularly racy or anything like that. Having said that, I recognize, again, a lot of people don't want to hear about these things. Feel free to skip this video. But I think this video is really important, which is why I'm doing it. Welcome to the label series on attraction, specifically aesthetic attraction, romantic attraction, and sexual attraction. First thing I'm going to do is editor me is going to shrink this video and shove me down a little bit so we have a little bit of space above my head. And the reason for that is that I'm going to be having three labels up, really four, but three labels up, aesthetic, romantic, and sexual. What these are indicating are my particular labels for my aesthetic attraction, romantic attraction, and sexual attraction at any given age. We're going to be going through this chronologically, and we're going to be starting at the age of six. I'm going to be going through a lot of the major events that kind of shaped the way I look at labels, and then I'm going to be explaining labels as they come up. Um, I will explain those labels up there momentarily, but let's start first at the age of six. And I'm saying the age of six, I actually don't know the exact age that I was at the time. I was likely six. It's possible that I would have been slightly before, this might have been slightly before my sixth birthday. What I know is that this started, or this particular event happened toward the start of my first grade year. Um, and I'm younger than normal when I was going through school. So for those of you in the US, most people in the sixth grade are six turning seven. I was five turning six. So just be advised, I'm six ish. So. In the first grade, my mother pulled me out of New Hampshire Public Schools. She really didn't like the schools. She didn't think that I gained any benefit whatsoever in kindergarten beyond a social benefit and decided, you know what, I can do better myself, so I'm going to. So I was homeschooled for the first half of my sixth grade year. Um, homeschool ended when my parents broke up and my mother moved to New York City, which meant I re-entered public schools in New York City. But we're not talking about that. We're talking about my homeschool education, which means that my mother was basically given a list of things that I would be expected to know by any given age and didn't really understand what they meant by it. Um, so for an example, there was a requirement of biology. What they meant by the requirement of biology was, hey, look, this is a cat. This is a dog. Cats and dogs are not the same. What my mother took out of that was, 
Oh, biology. So we should be talking about cells. Um, there's also mention of ecology. We should probably talk about plants, maybe get a microscope. That was the type of education that I received in the first grade. Um, it was the most concentrated form of education that I have received in my lifetime. And by far the best. It Nothing even comes close. Mostly because my mother started diving into things that I was interested in and started going greatly in depth. So, like, to give you an idea, I had all 50 states and all of their capitals memorized in about a week after I started, along with memorizing all the presidents, along with memorizing where each state was, how to spell each state, and yes, that includes Mississippi. A whole nine yards. This was, I, I had a typing class, I had, again, biology and ecology. Um, we were going to do more science things later on, but again, I was only six months. But anyway, the point is that I wanted to focus on the biology part. And my mother had two reasons why she gave me the birds and the bees talk at this age. And for reference, the birds and the bees talk is usually a kid's introduction to sexuality. Namely, their parents tell them where babies come from. Um, usually the first steps of the birds and the bees talk are very vague terms, as in, it's not a stork. When a mommy and daddy love each other very much, they can have a baby level, and that's about it. Did I mention the whole my mother frequently went in depth when she didn't need to? Yeah. Um, but the second reason why my mother did this is that one of the things that was being covered in my curriculum was drugs. And my mother, being an ex-hippie, and yes, she was a pot user, was. Um, as far as I know, she quit before I was born and stayed off outside of like one or two attempts past that for reasons that I'm not going to get into drugs. But anyway, the point is, is that she was on several prescriptions and these prescriptions um, initially were fertility drugs and later on became drugs to be able to regulate her hormones. And the reason being is that my mother was sterile. Yeah, so I was a one in a million shot of being born. Uh, my mother went through several miscarriages before and after me. Uh, as far as I know, she had a total of eight miscarriages, but that was as of the age of six. It's entirely possible that she had more than that because she talked to me about this along with telling me that of what sex is. Um, and she also explained that sex was for multiple reasons. You could have sex for the reason of wanting somebody to get pregnant. You could also have sex for pleasure. My mother was, at the time, very big on the idea of being open about things, where I can ask any question and she will answer. She's not going to lie to me. The only times that she ever lied to me were about Easter Bunny and Santa Claus. But that's it. So I had a very in-depth lesson on sexual education that I actually did not receive anything more in-depth than that until I was 20. <laughs> um, yeah, we'll get to that when I'm actually 20. But so this was my introduction to sexuality and romance and, well, not really aestheticism, but I'll get to that a bit later. But this was my introduction outside of pop culture. This was my formal education on it, and these are the terms that I would use today to de describe myself of back then. So these terms are going to be vocabulary that I would use today. Not everything that I'm going to be saying during this labels video is going to be vocabulary I use today for reference, but when it comes to the terminology up above my head, it absolutely is. So if I had the vocabulary then that I do today, how would I describe myself? And those are the answers. So let's go in order. So, one moment. Wanted to make sure that I wasn't using specialized terms. Um, aesthetic attraction is the attraction based off of a, somebody's physical appearance. Namely, that person looks really sexy. Or that person looks hot. Or that person is aesthetically pleasing. Hence the term aesthetic attraction. Uh, this is separate, even though popular culture does not treat it as such, but this is separate from both romantic and sexual attraction. Namely, you can walk down the street, see somebody that looks really, 
really cool and awesome in their physical appearance and go, that person looks really cool and awesome and keep walking and have zero romantic or sexual attraction to that person. Pop culture doesn't seem to indicate it that way. Pop culture seems to make aesthetic attraction equal to sexual attraction. I am not going to be defining it that way for this entire video for reasons that will become fairly obvious pretty quick. But at this particular age, I have no aesthetic attraction. Um, I thought that the term was an aesthetic attraction, but it doesn't appear to be. I can't find any reference on that, so I'm just going to leave it as none. Next up is romantic attraction. So at the age of six, I would surmise that pretty much every human has no romantic attraction to other humans. I know this is a big shock. Um, at the age of six, you are typically prepubescent, so which means that you have not gone through puberty, and you do not have romantic feelings. I certainly did not. And again, this, this may or may not change with time. All of these labels may stay the same the entire video. It may change. Nothing is wrong with either of those things. Finally, ace or asexual. I do not have sexual attraction to another human at the age of six. Again, big shock. I'm pretty sure most six-year-olds don't. But it's time to fast forward a bit. And we're going to be advancing several years. Now, humans, at least in American society, typically start going through puberty between the ages of 10 and 13. We're going to be stopping at the age of 11. I have not gone through puberty by this point. The reason why we're stopping at the age of 11 is that there was a particular event that happened at this age that I want to talk about. Specifically, this is the first time that I know of that someone had romantic attraction to me. It may be a crush. It may be more than a crush. I don't know. But, well, I should probably tell you the story. This would have been in seventh grade. Um, third grade, I was eight. So fourth grade, I would have been turning nine. Tenth grade, I would have been turning, or fifth grade, I would have been turning 10. Sixth grade, I would have been turning 11. So this was when I was 11. And my school was being split in half. And the reason being is that my school district for my middle school, middle school being grades six through eight where I was at, or again, the ages of 10 or 11 on to 13 or 14. Uh, so those awkward preteen slash teenage years, terrible. Anyway, um, my school district was splitting my particular school in half because a new middle school had opened up which meant that some of the people in my classes were getting moved to the new middle school that was closer to where they lived, presumably. It's Florida. The, they have had busing, which meant that you weren't necessarily going to the school that's closest to you because you may need to balance out um, races for the student body. So, for instance, if you lived in a majority white area, you may be bused to a school that's in a majority black area insert that for every other racial combination you can think of. But anyway, my friend, Brianna Polisi, uh, she was a good friend of mine. She and I got along great. We were both kind of outcasts. We were both geeks. Uh, we were both into the BBS scene. Uh, if I remember right, her and her dad actually operated an Amiga-based BBS. She was a big into Amigas as well. But she and I were friends, and I considered her a good friend but she was being moved to another school. And on the last day before she moved, she gave me a note. It was on heart stationery. She had put her perfume onto that note and that's when I found out that she had feelings for me. You will notice I have not changed any of the labels above my head though. I did not have romantic or sexual feelings for her because I had no romantic or sexual feelings for anyone. She was my friend. Obviously, I felt for her in purposes of she's my friend. And I didn't have any sense of aesthetic attraction either. So I couldn't tell you if she was beautiful or not, because that wasn't something that I thought about. Obviously, she had feelings for me because I thought she wouldn't have written the note. And it could have just been a crush. It could have been more. I don't know. She's still alive today. Um, I couple of years back, I googled to see what may have happened to her because she doesn't have a Facebook page or anything. And apparently she's still living in South Florida. So hopefully her life is going well. 
Maybe she'll even see this video. I don't know. That'd be interesting to talk to her again. Maybe get her perspective on things. But anyway, the reason why I bring it up is that this is the first instance that I knew of of somebody being attracted to me. And it happened without me realizing it. I did not know until I had received that note. Whoops. Would I have done anything different? Probably not, because again, I wasn't attracted to anyone. But I still had this pop culture viewpoint of... Ugh, this viewpoint is terrible, by the way. Friendship is the first stage before romance. Romance is the first stage before sex. So getting up there for an extra year, this year tw I, know, I was 12 years old at the time, I had another friend in class who was black. And with that pop culture viewpoint, I had been thinking, well, I have a friend who's not the same gender as me. Does that mean I'm going to be romantically attracted to her? Wait, she has a different skin color than me. I know there's a lot of weird things going on about skin color everywhere, mostly because uh, I lived in Florida. There, racism definitely exists in Florida. Um, it exists everywhere. But I should talk with my mom about this because my mom always said that I can talk to her about anything. Remember what I had said when I was, uh, what she had said when I was six. This part has not changed at all. So I talked to her about it. Yeah, turns out my mom has had some cultural racism. Uh oh. By cultural racism, what I mean is, uh, so cultural osmosis being being able to absorb culture that you're not necessarily directly impacted by. She had that when it came to racism. Um, she had problems with the idea of a kid being multiracial or multiethnic and told me so. So that was fun. <sighs> um, I'm pretty sure she would have been horrified if I had mentioned this again, you know, before she died. Because she doesn't view herself, she didn't view herself as racist, but this was the 90s. Yeah, she was racist. Um, probably still was, still is. Well, not still is, she's dead. But anyway. So that was my brief foray into a what if. Um... Her name was Tanisha. I don't remember her last name anymore. But let's advance a little bit more. And stop. All right, so at this point, I was 16. By this point, I had started working. Just summers, not during school or anything. I did lots of things, and this is probably the very beginnings of me in puberty. Because believe it or not, I was a really late bloomer when it came to puberty. Um, it was also around the time of my final growth spurt. So my height today is about the height that I was at the age of 16, or at least by the end of the age of 16. And this is where things started changing a little bit. You'll notice some question marks above my head. It's because... Again, using the terminology that I know today, I have no freaking clue how to define myself in terms of aesthetics. Romance, I was still not romantically attracted to anyone at all. I never had the, ew, girls are icky type of phase or anything like that. I had plenty of people of multiple genders who I were friends with. I have no issues with that. It was just... Uh... So, the reason why I'm stopping at the age of 16 is because of a specific incident. Namely, this is the first time that I was sexually proposed for anything. The weird part is that I was actually propositioned for a threesome. Um, let me backtrack and explain. So, this was while I was in English class. And I think I was 16. I might have been 15 at the time, now that I'm thinking about it. Either way. Um... I was proposed by somebody who would be considered conventionally attractive. She had blonde hair. I don't remember a whole bunch about her anymore because it's been too long. And she wasn't one of my friends for reference. She was just a classmate. And she asked me if I wanted to have a threesome with her and another girl in the class. Yep, yep, that still says asexual up there. That hasn't changed. I had zero 
romantic or sexual attraction to anyone at this particular stage of my life. So, quite rudely, I assumed that she was making fun of me and asked her to stop making fun of me and stop picking on me. She was stunned, took a, step back, a few steps back, and walked away, and I never spoke to her again. Later on, I found out that she was actually being serious. Well, maybe not serious about the threesome part. I think she may have had some issues when it came to what society expected of a woman to attract somebody, and she probably did have romantic feelings for me. And that was the way that she thought would be the best way to actually get my attention. I mean, I remember the incident, so I suppose I did get... She did get my attention, but yeah, I wasn't attracted to her at all. She wasn't even one of my friends. I barely knew her. That was the first time that I was ever approached sexually for anything. It's not the last, but it's an important event in terms of these labels. But you will notice the way I described her, conventionally attractive. This is the, also the very first incident, or instance, where I remember actually thinking somebody was attractive. This is probably the point where I am no longer lacking in aesthetic attraction. I would instead say that I am panesthetically attracted to people. Time to do some definitions here. So... Let's get the big one out of the way. Pen versus bi. So I'm going to express this in terms of sexuality because this is the way society tends to present it. And it's going to be a little bit easier to explain that way. Bisexuality is the sexual attraction to one or more genders. Pansexuality is the sexual attraction to one or more genders. The LGBT space has a lot of debates as to if there is a difference and what the difference actually is between these. Some people trying to be trans-exclusionary, trying to use bisexuality as an excuse to say, oh, you're bisexual, so you're only attracted to two genders. <laughs> Forget all of that. I'm giving you my definition of the difference between these two, because I actually do have a clear difference in my mind between the terms of bi and pan. So bisexuality versus pansexuality. Bisexuality is that you have an attraction to two or more genders. That attraction doesn't and is dependent on the gender. So for instance, you may find features of a man that you find sexually attractive, and you may have features of a woman that you find sexually attractive, and those features may not have much in common. May have a whole bunch in common, but there's a difference between those. And the same goes for sexual attraction to somebody who is non-binary. Sexual attraction to somebody who's gender fluid. Maybe that your sexual attraction changes based off of the gender that they're currently identifying themselves as. These are all signs to me of bi. Pan, on the other hand, ignores the label of gender for your attraction. In other words, by being pansexual, you would be sexually attracted to people. Gender is not actually a qualifier in your attraction. If you are sexually attracted to a man and sexually attracted to a woman and sexually attracted to somebody who's non-binary, somebody who's third spirit or anything, two-spirit, I did that last time when I was talking about genders, um, then your brain and how it handles being sexually attracted to people probably doesn't change based off of gender. It may still change based off of person, but... Gender is not a label that matters for attraction. Thus, panasceticism is being aesthetically attracted to people regardless of gender. That is the way I defined myself at the age of 15 slash 16. Here's my spicy hot take. That label right there is what the majority of people on Earth would be classified as. Either that or or bi-aesthetic. Because the majority of people that I have interacted with, and this could totally be a cultural thing, this could be the groups of people that I'm hanging around with, 
but this is for my entire life. This isn't just for my current group of people that I'm hanging around with. This isn't just for people back then. This is people in general seem to have an aesthetic appreciation for physical attractiveness in people of multiple genders. A man who is heterosexual, I have multiple friends who are heterosexual men, can identify another man as, man, that guy is sexy. They're not necessarily sexually attracted to that guy, but they can have an aesthetic appreciation for the physical attributes of that guy, even though that they themselves may not be sexually or romantically attracted to that person. That is what I mean by most people are probably bi or pan aesthetic, and I am included in that. So that's my spicy hot take for this video. Hope you liked it. Um, anyway, getting back to age, you'll notice that, again, I am still labeling myself as aromantic and asexual. Ah, good. Slightly later. Oh, there's a new question mark up there, isn't it? So, by this point, my mother was getting worried. And... I'll explain a lot of the details later, like timing-wise when she explained them to me, because it's going to be relevant, but she was getting worried because at this point she had noticed that I didn't seem to be going out on dates. Now, keep in mind, I was not conventionally attractive. Um, this is a little dangerous territory for me because I do have body dysmorphia disorder. I don't consider myself attractive ever. So, you know, there's that. But... Let's be honest, I was a 16-year-old, uh, pimples everywhere, overweight, constantly sweaty, because I was in Florida, always sweaty. Probably smelled quite a bit. Not probably. I definitely smelled quite a bit. I was not at all physically attractive. So, in her mind, that meant that there was something wrong with me. She didn't say that at the time. But this is also around the point where I started developing crushes on people. Sort of. So I need to describe something for the audience. And this is going to be very personal for me. But, well, nothing's... Again, no, no content of this video is something I wouldn't describe to... If I had a child who was 13, I wouldn't be describing to them in the exact same terms. So, I don't notice when I'm romantically attracted to people. I noticed the symptoms of being romantically attracted after the fact. So when I say that I started developing crushes on people at about this age, what I mean is that I didn't notice that I had crushes on people until significantly later than this. But this is the point where I started having crushes on people. And at this point, all of my crushes were of the same gender that was different from my own. Thus... I would classify myself as heteroromantic at this point. I had, I am a guy. I had crushes on people who were girls. I'm going to use the term girl because they were under the age of 18. So was I for that matter. If we were both over the age, I would use women. But you get the idea. They were all girls. And there weren't very many of them. I just thought that they were neat, logically. But... When you have a romantic attraction to someone, your behavior starts changing a bit. You'll start focusing a little bit more on them. You'll start paying attention to them. You'll start kind of daydreaming about them. At least I did. I can't necessarily speak for anybody else. But I didn't really daydream about being in a relationship with them. I just started paying them more attention. Turns out that's actually the way I express romantic interest. And I didn't realize this until I was older. So, 16-ish, I am in the middle of puberty. Puberty basically hit me with a baseball bat. Uh, I went through almost the entire thing in the course of one year. It's not great. Um, but let's fast forward a bit. Now I'm 18. I just graduated from high school. I was in college. And being in college, I had roommates. 
or a roommate in my dorm room. Uh, he did, in fact, have sex in the dorm room with his then-girlfriend while I was sleeping, or thought I was sleeping. I woke up part of the way through. Why is the bed moving? Oh, they're having sex. Just rolled over and went back to sleep. I have not a care in the world about that type of thing. But this is the point where, one, I recognize that I had a romantic attraction to people back then. Two... I recognize that I didn't have a sexual attraction to people because I'm now around people who are openly having sex. I didn't feel anything like that at all. So this is the age that I would absolutely have used asexual for myself, even actually knowing the correct terminology at the time. And three, I realized that I had a romantic attraction to somebody who is my own gender. Hello there, Pan Romantic. How are you? Yeah. So, my attraction, my romantic attraction to people does not seem to be based on gender. While most of the people that I am romantically attracted to have a gender identity different than my own, it's not 100%. And there's still a really tiny number of people. From what I've spoken with friends, I and probably gray romantic, which is to say that gray romantic is a partial form of aromantic. Um, or actually, more specifically, I think I may be demi-romantic, but that's a relatively common term. Demi-romantic or demisexual or anything like that. Um, demisexual is a sexual attraction to somebody who you are already romantically attracted to, and exclusively only sexual attraction to people who are you are romantically attracted to. So the proverbial, hey, look, there's a beautiful person walking down the street, I would like to do them, is not a thing that demi-romantics or demisexual folk really think about. That's not a thing for them at all. Similarly, demi-romantic people need to have some other form of bond with a person, usually friendship. But it could be a work bond, it could be something like that, a great example of this is the idea of pre-modern internet. This would be going out to a bar. Postmodern or current internet would be going on Tinder or something like that and trying to get a date. The concept of that is completely baffling to me. I don't understand why somebody would do that. Now, trying to use a Tinder to find a friend, that sounds great to me. I mean, especially like you might be new to a particular town. That's a great way to find friends. That's okay. Why would you be trying to find a romantic partner that way? Wouldn't you get attracted to a romantic partner later? So, yeah. Um, Demi Pan Romantic would probably be the way I would describe myself. Um, this is also around the time that I started speaking with my partner. Now, at the time, I was not romantically attracted to my partner whatsoever. Just, this is around the time that we started speaking more than just passing acquaintance level. Uh, but again, you will notice, I still classify myself as ace. There's nothing wrong with that, but it's not typical in society, shall we say. Um, by this point, I recognize that, yeah, I'm definitely pan -aesthetic. Again, I didn't have the vocabulary at the time to state that, but I could easily pick out, yeah, that person's really attractive, holy crap, and then keep walking because they're attractive. That's just a label onto that person. It's a label that I put on another person. Somebody else may not find that same person attractive, and that's fine. Again, nothing wrong with that. Moving on a little bit. My partner admitted to me that they were in love with me when I was 19. This didn't take me by surprise. I actually knew in advance about it because um, a prior acquaintance of my partner told me about it. I think he was trying to do the whole rage quit a relationship type of thing, and I didn't understand. Uh, I'm too ace to understand this type of thing. And I knew about it in advance, but my partner actually wrote me a relatively long email, which I wish I still had, but unfortunately... Microsoft wiped my Hotmail account. Oh, I'm still pissed off about that. Anyway, 
um, wrote a long letter explaining that they're attracted to me. And I sat down and started thinking. Because, again, I had only recognized that I was actually romantically attracted to anyone at all a year ago. Um, this would have been my second year of college at the time. And going into my third year, I should say. And I sat and thought about it. Remember what I had mentioned before about the way that I handle romance is that I can only v look at it retrospectively. So I started noticing, okay, I recognize how I am romantically attracted to people. They're crushes. I've had crushes. I've had crushes on multiple genders worth of people. What's in common? How did I react? Well, again, I put special focus on that person. I kind of would drift off thinking about that person. I would want to hug them. To be fair, I want to hug my friends too, so that part doesn't help that much. But I want to hug them specifically, and not just I want a hug, but I want a hug from them. Several other things. And then I started thinking, have I done that with my partner? The answer is yes. We had never met in person. Didn't matter. So I ended up eventually responding to the email with, yes, I'm attracted to you too. Let's have a relationship. And that's not exactly the terms I used. I have no idea because I lost all of my email. <sighs> Still pissed off about that. Um, so at the age of 20, my this would have been actually about this time of year, in fact. So it would have, my partner came to visit me while I was in the dorms for Thanksgiving week. Uh, for reference, the time I'm recording this, this is the week before Thanksgiving. So it's about this time of year, actually. My partner flew from Norway to Fort Wayne, Indiana. First time in the U.S. First time going overseas. Their flight was late. I remember because I was barely awake. Um, I had a friend with me. Two friends with me, actually. Who are still friends today. I'm one of them by just saw last week and would normally be seeing today but role playing's cancelled um and I saw them get out of security at the Fort Wayne airport which Fort Wayne airport tiny and just knew immediately that I was right the only thing I focused on at that point was hug I was no longer anywhere near as exhausted I just wanted to hold them We had been talking for that summer. Um, I would have still been 19 at the time, but I've already incremented this to 20, but whatever. Um, about sex. So my partner was sexually attracted to me. And you'll notice, ace. But if there's one thing that everyone knows about me is that I am incredibly curious about everything. So one of the things that I said was that I wanted to try and see. It could be another situation like romance, where I'd only notice attraction in hindsight, in the rearview mirror. And I wasn't opposed to it. So my form of asexuality that I would define back then and define today is not that of being sex repulsive. So one moment, I'm going to make sure I get this right. There are two main categories of asexuality. There's sex, re sex repulsed and sexually indifferent. Sex repulsed is the idea that having sex is vile and repulsive to them. Them having sex. That doesn't necessarily mean that they don't experience arousal, so to speak. So, for instance, if somebody who is sex repulsed wanted to become aroused, they may watch porn. And that's fine because it's not them having sex. That's the part that makes them repulsed. Sexually indifferent, on the other hand, it's more of a, I guess, uh, it's not really something I'm seeking out, but sure, I guess, maybe, or nah, that sounds like effort and I don't want to. There's no repulsion part about it. There's just indifference. And that's the way I would describe my sexuality at that particular time was I was sexually indifferent asexual.
my partner and I did have sex. In fact, we actually had sex before our first date, uh, which is why when people ask me for um, romance tips, I just start screaming inside of my head because I do nothing in the correct order. Again, our first date happened, I think it was like a day or two after the first time that we had sex and second and so on. But I had sex and it turns out kind of liked it. Yeah, I had no idea what the hell's going on back then because I had it in my mind that sex was just, eh, who cares? Even then, afterward, I was still, well, I'll get to that in a moment, but I was very confused. I'm going to leave that as a question mark for a while. Fast forward about a month. I came home for Christmas and talked with my mom. Remember what I mentioned before, I could always talk to my mom about anything? I had not talked to her about sexuality since ever. I just didn't. And I told her that I had sex for the first time. She wanted to throw me a party. So, backing up a bit, I had mentioned before that my mom was getting concerned. And the reason why she was concerned is that she assumed that I was gay. Not that she had problems with me being gay. The concern was the fact that I wasn't coming to talk with her. The concern was the idea that she thought that I need... I, she thought that I thought I needed to hide in the closet from her. And that made her very, very sad and started tearing her heart apart. Which, in reality, the fact is, uh, I didn't have sexual attraction at all. So... I probably should have told the story a bit earlier, but the story didn't quite click until around this time. My mom had described one of her friends, um, like, old friend, person that she hung around with back when she would have been younger than me today. Um, one of her friends in Florida as bisexual. But... She had mentioned that he didn't think he was bisexual. He thought he was asexual. But asexual people don't exist. Guess why I never talked to my mom about it. It clicked at that point, going, of course I didn't talk to her about it. She literally told me that my own sexuality didn't exist. So my mom and I had a long talk at that point. Um, my mom was not asexual at all. In fact... It's entirely possible that she was bi or pan and didn't mention it because she didn't really mention gender at all. But my mom was very sexual. Um, I knew that she went out when I was a kid to bars. She specifically went out to go have sex. Um, kid mean didn't really put that part together. She went out on dates, but she went out to the bar without having a date to begin with. And then she would come back late, uh, usually after I went to bed, because I was the type of kid that set my own bedtime. Technically, I never had a curfew. Um, I can go to bed whenever I wanted. I just needed to be up in the morning for school or work or whatever. But she out definitely did. Um, she brought in a boyfriend who was closer in age to me than her at one point. Um, he would have been like early mid-20s and she would have been in her 40s. So, violating the half plus seven rule. Uh, and I knew that they had sex, because she had told me about it, and had mentioned that she had sex without a condom. And explain, used it as a teaching moment to explain to me the steps that she was going to be taking. She was going to go take an STD test. She couldn't get pregnant at the time, so she knew that that part was okay, but she was going to do a pregnancy test anyway, just in case. Whole nine yards. All of this started entering my mind when my mom and I were having this talk. And she was concerned about the fact that I wasn't enjoying sex. It's not that I wasn't enjoying sex. I literally used the statement, if I had to choose between hugs and sex, I will take hugs. I still agree with that statement for that matter. Hugs are awesome. What in the world are you talking about? You can hug lots of people and assuming that they want to hug you back, it's great. There's as much risk of 
disease and infection as there is just being around other people. You don't have to worry about the after effects of sex. You don't have to worry about pregnancy in the event that that's actually a thing that you have to worry about. You don't have to worry about STDs. You don't have to worry about all of these things. You can hug family members. You can hug anyone who's willing to hug you back. That's great. Turns out, the reason why is because I'm still ace. Sort of. Now, this is something that I have thought about quite a bit since then. Keep in mind, this was when I was 20. I'm 38. It's been 18 years. But what you see above my head is effectively what I am today. Which is, I am panesthetic, panromantic, possibly demi-panromantic. That part is really hard for me to figure out. And I am... Eh? Yeah. The full term that I would use is that I am demisexual, which is to say that I only have sexually attraction, uh, only have sexual attraction to people that I have a romantic relationship with. I have had a grand total of one romantic relationship in my life, which means that my partner is literally the only person on the planet I am sexually attracted to. Not joking. There's no exaggeration in that whatsoever. There's they're the only one. Now, I am still indifferent when it comes to my asexuality, which is to say that, yes, I am only attracted to my partner and nobody else. But, for instance, if my partner proposed a threesome and I knew that they really wanted it and everybody was okay with it, I would probably go along because my partner would enjoy it. I probably wouldn't, but I also wouldn't not enjoy it, if that makes sense. So... Yeah. I frequently classify myself for ease of speech and so on as ace. Or gray ace, because I like the term grace. That's kind of a cool way of phrasing it. Um, but the full expression of my sexuality is kind of a giant question mark, because it doesn't make sense in the terms of labels of pop culture. I could literally only be attracted to one person on the planet, and if I wasn't in a romantic relationship with them, I would still be sexually attracted to them? That's possible. I don't know, because of the order that I took things in. <coughs> because I was in a romantic relationship with my partner before I was in a sexual relationship with my partner. Even if the in-person part was only a couple of days. I don't know. It is entirely possible that I am sexually attracted to more than just my partner, because what I had mentioned before, I have to look in hindsight on these things. But what I do know is that I have some anecdotes of my life that seem to indicate that demisexuality is the correct label for me. As an example, I am not necessarily opposed to porn. Obviously, there's a huge amount of problems in the porn industry, don't get me wrong, but, you know, I can totally be aroused by people having sex, as long as they're people that I don't know. One particular performer I happened to start knowing. I wouldn't say that I was a friend with this person or anything like that, like acquaintance level at best, but I knew who they were, I knew their name, and I immediately stopped being aroused entirely. It just, bloop, nope. Because they're now a person, and I am not sexually attracted to that person. A fantasy is a completely different story. Fantasies, you can do whatever you want. I don't care because it's all in here. The moment that you act on those fantasies can definitely be problematic. Porn is a fantasy. It is not reality. Erotica is a fantasy. It is not reality. All of these things are fantasies. They are not reality. The moment fantasy starts shifting to reality is when those attractive labels that I said above start coming into play. And for me, that means that I... Okay, the moment that becomes reality, my brain goes, nope, 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 nope. Not happening. Nuh-uh. 
So most likely, I am demisexual. Let's move on a bit, because there's still something left. This would have been, I realized it around the age of 22. I had been, this is after I graduated from college, but I was still in Angola, which is where I went to school. Um, I was still involved in theater. I was still involved with multiple things going on around campus. I was still role-playing with people that were living on campus and so on. Basically, I was still attached to the college scene because there's not really much else to do in Angola. Um, it's a really tiny town. And remember what I mentioned about only noticing things in hindsight? I noticed that I was romantically attracted to someone whose name I will not be mentioning because there is a chance that they will be watching this. While I'm still romantically attracted to my partner. Remember what I said about I've been in one romantic relationship? That is true. I've only been in one romantic relationship. But all of a sudden, I have romantic feelings for another person. What? This wasn't covered in my knowledge at all at the time. So I did what I thought was best, which was to talk with my best friend about it. My best friend is my partner. There's the stereotype, especially in Hollywood, but pretty much everywhere in Western culture, of guys cheating on their spouses, trying to hide them from sight or anything like that. My very first inkling to do when I started having romantic feelings for another person is to talk to my spouse. Well, we weren't married at the time. Still not technically married, but just talk with my partner. That is my very first instinct. You know why? Because they're my best friend. And I am open to talking with people. And I want to be open about talking with people in general. That's when I realized I'm Polly. I have romantic feelings for more than one person simultaneously. I have zero issues with the idea of having romantic feelings with more than one person simultaneously, assuming everybody is okay with it. This person I never approached. As far as I know, they are still completely unaware as to my feelings for them. And yes, it was more than a crush. The reason why I did not mention anything is that I did not want to ruin the friendship. I have a personal extremely high value on friendship. And one, I had no idea if this person would even be attracted to me in a romantic sense. I had no idea if they were even attracted to people, I had never seen them on dates or anything like that, but it was also probably more that I wasn't in the correct friend circle for that. But I still don't know if they had any feelings for me, or if they have feelings for me, which is the reason why they're not being mentioned. Um, I started noticing those same things that I had described before about the hindsight of romantic attraction, of focusing more on them, kind of picturing myself nearby them, wanting to be hugged specifically by them, and so on. I have no sexual attraction to this person, for reference. Had none then, still have none now. Because I'm not in a romantic relationship with them. That's the other evidence that the demisexuality is probably very accurate. But... <coughs> my partner and I had discussed... And my partner was actually encouraging me to talk to them. Which I find ironic given popular culture and so on of the guy cheating on people and so on. Uh, nope, I have no intention of doing anything like that. And there may come a time that I am romantically interested in another person. And that's fine from my perspective. As long as everybody knows about it. So one of the things when my partner and I talked is that if I do find that I have these feelings again, I'm going to be talking with my partner about it. And if I do end up approaching this person, I will be approaching them and flat out state, yes, I am in a romantic relationship right now. My partner knows that I am talking to you. 
So where's that leave me? Well, I... A few people... Uh, this was at work a few years ago, pre-pandemic, um, had asked me if I was a member of the um, LGBT community. And the answer is, I'm not a member of the community, but I am LGBT, LGBTQIA, etc., etc. And up there, um, none of those are, or all three of those are considered to be queer labels. <laughs> well, the... Aesthetic attraction, one, aestheticism isn't something that's usually mentioned outside of the asexual community, and that's because most people attract that, or combine that and that together. Um, I don't, and that might be because I'm too ace to think about anything else, but ignoring that one for the time being, my romantic definition is absolutely in the queer community. Holy crap, I have way too many words up there. And same with the sexuality. So, getting back to that, all of those things are labels that I have att attributed to myself. None of those are things that anyone outside of a small group of people knew about me. Well, Somebody could probably figure out the um, aesthetic attraction part if they had really thought about it, because I have commented about the physical attractiveness of people before. And the things that I consider physically attractive really don't have anything to do with gender. Uh, and they also don't have anything to do with my romantic or sexual attraction to people, for that matter. It's completely independent. The romantic attraction? Uh, yeah. My partner didn't even know I was pan-romantic until I talked to them before I started recording this video. I mean, they probably knew that I was attracted, and they didn't know that I had attributed that label to myself. That's probably the way I should phrase it. Um, because I don't really care about gender. Can you understand why I don't, and there is no gendered term anywhere up there. Do you understand why I have such a hard time with gender? It's because I personally don't care. I really, really, really don't care. So my experiences with gender tend to be really weird as a result. But my experiences with sexuality are even weirder. I am a 38-year-old man who has had one sexual partner in their lifetime, one romantic partner in their lifetime. I'm perfectly happy with that. Yes, I am poly. That does mean that I have zero issues with having more than one romantic partner. That doesn't mean I'm actually seeking out another romantic partner, mind you. It's more that I am not just open to it, but would be happy with it. The idea of expecting one romantic partner to fulfill all of your romantic needs seems a little weird to me. Wouldn't it be easier to have two people? As long as everybody knows about each other and everybody's okay with it, that's not really a problem. But unfortunately, that's probably the one of those labels that I would be discriminated the most against. So, for instance, in the United States, you cannot have a romantic relationship with more than one person if you're married to one of them. That is illegal in many jurisdictions. Adultery is actually a civil offense in a good chunk of the United States. Also, immigration-wise. So, I'm going to be getting married to my partner in the next few months, depending on when we can get all the paperwork together. And if I were to have another romantic partner, that would make things really complicated really fast. Uh, so, yeah. This has been a weird video. Too many labels above my head. Okay. But there you have it. Um... If anybody has questions, ask. I'm fairly open about these things. Even though this is the first time I've talked in public about uh, most of this, I'm generally open about things. I'll talk to you later, Internet.